Welcome to Wicked Problems, Wolfpack Solutions, Global Change. My name is Lauren Gibson and I'm a third year PhD student here at NC State. I'm in the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management, studying environmental education in the NC State Environmental Education Lab. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Katherine Stevenson. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So um, I'm Katherine Stevenson. Lauren and I know each other well. Um, I'm your advisor. Um, I'm also in the Parks, Recreation and Tourism Department. I'm an associate professor there. Um, and I'm really excited to hear about, or to, to be here today. Wonderful. Uh, would you like to start by telling us a little bit about your research? Sure. So um, as you know, Lauren, um, it, broadly, um, we study children in nature. So we are interested in both what, how um, being outside benefits kids and how kids can offer unique solutions to environmental challenges. Um, so those are kind of the two buckets that, we, that we, our research falls under. Um, and when we think about benefits of being outside to kids, um, we, we think about lots of things. Um, being outside, particularly in natural areas, seems to do things like support um, learning. We work with schools a lot. And so getting kids outside tends to help them kind of create new opportunities for learning and sometimes support students in ways that they're not supported in the classroom. So it can kind of boost learning in exciting ways and get kids excited about learning. Um, it also, in the College of Natural Resources, we're really excited about connecting people to nature. And so being outside seems to do a good job at getting kids excited about the environment and excited about being outside. Um, and also that seems to also link to things like improved mental health. Um, and so getting outside seems, tends to make people in general, but including kids, less stressed and more physically um, active. And it, especially like in the context of this year, that's more important than ever. So we're really excited about kind of thinking about uh, what benefits people get from being engaged with nature and how to promote that more. So that's one area of our research. Um, the other area that I think we'll probably focus on more today is that we're interested in how uh, kids can um, kind of present unique solutions to environmental challenges. Um, and so we can dig into that more, but in a nutshell, um, at least we seem to think that uh, when kids are engaged in environmental challenges and they're um, engaging adults to, to be in conversation about the environment, it helps adults particularly think about the environment in a little bit different way. And hopefully in a way that works against the political gridlock that we find ourselves in for every issue, but also, it's certainly including environmental issues, and we seem to think that um, our, our research would suggest that kids offer a different perspective that helps bring people together. Um, and I'm increasingly convinced that that's a, a really important contribution that kids can make. Awesome. Awesome. I definitely do want to dig into that more. Um, but first, how did you get interested in this field to begin with? So that's a good question. So um, I think, um, as a, I guess, as a message to incoming students too, I think that often your uh, your road looks a lot more intuitive and well thought out in retrospect than it did moving forward. So I didn't I didn't come into college thinking I wanted to be a college professor and study this as a researcher. Um, if anything, I thought I just kind of want to be done with school as soon as possible. <laughs> But it turns out I love it. Um, so I, when I um, entered undergrad, I didn't didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I came in undeclared. That was like acceptable where I went, and even encouraged. And um, but I majored in biology, and I thought that I wanted to do sort of field biology work. Um, so it would be akin to sort of the wildlife program here. Um, I worked in a herpetology lab and got out in the field a lot, and I really I loved it. Um, but then by the end of my time at Davidson, that's where I was, um, I, um, I realized that really what was driving me was when we could take our animals to classrooms and share them with kids or get our um, kids in particular, but even our communities um, out to the lab to see our animals and talk to them more about what we did. I realized kind of the outreach and education stuff was what I really loved the most. And so from there, I, I got into education. I worked as a residential outdoor educator for a while um, and then worked as a high school teacher. And um, through all of that, I was getting my students outside as much as possible, um, partly because I liked it, <laughs> but also because um, I just was, I saw a real change in students um, when I take them outside. They just seemed to be more engaged in what we were learning and they were happier and were like nicer to each other. <laughs> and I just, I loved it. And so when I, um, when I 
thought I wanted to come back to graduate school. I kind of wanted to study that, like this, this area of getting kids outside, which I still am. And so when I got into this work I, for my dissertation work, I was looking at sort of what builds what we call environmental literacy with kids. So it's um, how do we help them learn about the environment, but also care about it and be motivated to kind of take action. Uh, so I was, I was interested in sort of what are the predictors of that or what are the drivers of environmental literacy? Um, and then in that work, I also got interested specifically in climate change. And I think that's probably most, most applicable to what, what this, the series is about. Um, and what I was interested in, and this was again, probably about a decade ago is when um, social science research around climate change really was starting to get a lot of traction. And it was a very productive time. It still is productive, but this is when we started to see more and more research come out um, about how polarized people are about climate change in particular. Um, and that <laughs> not to be totally defeatist, but it was sort of insurmountable. <laughs> because, and what I mean by that is that there, there tended to be more and more studies that came out that said, um, sort of the better you are at science and numbers, the more polarized people become. Meaning that smart, the people, like kind of the, the smarter you are and the better you are at science, the better you are at kind of taking information and using it to reinforce what you already think. Um, and I think increasingly that's, that, that is sort of true of, of, of climate change or kind of any issue. Smart people are just really good at, at kind of reinforcing the way they already see the world. <laughs> and that's not a dig, that's just sort of how people work, right? And, but that is really a disheartening narrative um, when we think about trying to bring people together for environmental issues or specifically as an educator, um, because we're sort of trained to think, well, if you just engage people in the issues, they will like learn about it and learn together and kind of work together towards some sort of collaborative common ground issue. And that's just not the way it, it seems to be working among adults. Um, and so when I first started studying this, I was, I had been kind of in this kid world and thinking like, I don't know if that's really true of kids. Like, I wonder if they're as polarized, is that how kids are learning about these issues? And so that's when I really got into climate change education research. Um, and so we sort of, we replicated some of the studies they've been doing with adults, um, looking at our main questions were, first of all, are kids polarized like adults around climate change? And do they learn in similar ways? Meaning as you teach them about climate change, do they just become more polarized, which is what seems to happen among adults. Um, and we found quite the opposite, which was really encouraging, right? We found that kids, as they learned about climate change, instead of becoming more polarized, they kind of came together. Um, and I think that, I mean, this isn't a dig at, at anyone. I think most people, no matter what side of any issue you're on, I think as a country, we're sort of exasperated by polarization in general, because I think it can breed gridlock and then nothing gets done, right? So there was sort of this glimmer of hope that kids were thinking about these things a little differently in a way that might kind of find common ground instead of drive people apart. So I've, I thought that was really exciting. And then from there, we've sort of, there, over the last decade or so, we've kind of layered on that study and dug into this more. Um, and so I guess once we were kind of understanding that kids were thinking differently than adults, uh, we, we also sort of moved on to thinking, okay, so let's study, first of all, how kids learn about this. So we started um, kind of following kids over time, looking at over a school year, how do they learn about climate change? Um, does, do they become more concerned? Do they become hopeful? Do they become despaired? How does that work? Um, and in, in general, we find that as kids learn about climate change, they become more concerned, which is not shocking. It's really heavy stuff, <laughs> but they also tend to remain hopeful. And then when those two things are present, it seems to breed some, some desire for action, uh, which I think, I think is, is healthy. Um, and then from there too, we were also interested in how kids might, um, what would happen if kids were leading conversations about climate change, meaning if they're thinking about climate change differently than adults, if they are in conversation with adults, does that also help adults think about things a little differently? Um, and kind of what we found is, is yes, they do. Um, so, and this is a long winded answer of how I got interested in this, but essentially just got more and more exciting, at least to us. Uh, so uh, we did a study um, a couple years ago where we, we um, 
had kids kind of learn about climate change in their classrooms with their teachers over the course of the year. And then we just asked them to go home and share what they were learning about. So these were just kind of simple conversations. We had a couple of prompts to say, um, to, to ask kids to sort of share what they were learning in the classroom. And they were engaged in some service learning projects around climate change and just sort of ask them to share that experience with their, their parents as just sort of a conversation starter. And what, uh, what we found, and then we, we sort of surveyed, we surveyed kids and their parents across the year. And what we found is that through that learning process, the kids became more, climate, more concerned about climate change as they went along, but also their parents did. Um, and that was, that was really interesting because we, we didn't talk to the parents, the kids were. Um, and even more interesting to us was that the concern level increased among parents, but that was particularly true when daughters were leading the conversation and when we were surveying men, so assumedly dads, it could be grandparents or whatever, um, and also those who identified as politi politi politically conservative, uh, which, was, which was really interesting, we thought, because those are the, the groups in general that are typically less concerned about climate change. So it's it that study, at least the way we're interpreting it, it's again, it's more about bringing people kind of toward common ground. So not everybody was on the same page after the same after this the study, but people were kind of thinking along more along the same lines as they were when we started. So that has kind of been the theme moving forward: is how can kids um, kind of help people come together a little bit around climate change or any environmental topic. That's, that's really cool. Obviously I'm biased, but I <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate the results of that study. Um, what do you think it was about those conversations between kids and parents that, that really made that impact? So that, that's a good question. And that is a good example of something that we don't know exactly. Right. So, um, researchers, when we dig into something, we kind of find, we don't, we don't know, we don't know the depths of it, but I think I, we have a couple hunches. Um, one of which is that uh, often environmental topics, at least um, from my personal experience and sort of thinking about how people learn about the environment, often um, environmental topics are sort of future oriented, meaning that when we think of something as big as climate change, for instance, um, often when we the impacts can seem sort of like one off when you think of them isolated. So like right now, for instance, we um, I just came back from a trip out west. It's really hot there. right? <laughs> and, it's, and the wildfires are popping up earlier than they ever have. Right. That is it's possible that that could be just just a fluke summer. But when you zoom out and look at the patterns, it's pretty compelling that this is some some sort of climate change related impact. So that's one thing is that it's it's sometimes for these environmental issues, you have to kind of zoom out and look at a big pattern. The other thing is, is that often environmental impacts are um, the decisions we make now show up later, right? And it's very easy to say, well, we just need to do this to get over this hump and then we'll deal with the consequences later. So, but when you're talking to children, I think it makes the future a lot more tangible and in the moment. So um, for instance, we think about um, scientists will say that climate change impacts um, will be sort of a, a, like really intense levels around 2040. So I, I have children. And when I look at my six-year-old and think about how old she's going to be when, she, when in 2040, that becomes a lot more tangible. She's going to be just starting her life, right? So it's it makes those impacts when you're talking with children kind of be, you just see them in a different light. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing I think is that when, when we talk about um, polarization around environmental topics or anything, it's really a question of values, right? So it's like what people value. People have different values. And I think that's great. We live in a democracy. We want to have diversity of thought, right? And everybody has their, their values and how they see the world. And that's fine. Um, where it becomes sometimes a problem is, is that when it drives our conversation so far apart, it's really hard to find any common ground. And my hunch is that talking with kids activates sort of a common value that I would, I think most of us share, which is wanting a better future for our kids. And so when kids are talking to you, not only are environmental issues more tangible, you're like, oh, the future kind of is now, it's embodied in this child. 
Um, also, it's hard to look at a child and not sort of want what's best for them. And so I think that is a, a value that we all share. And if we're holding all these values at the same time, it might activate a value that most of us have in common. And it might encourage us to sort of find common ground rather than sort of go into our corners. Great. great. So you mentioned at the beginning of that uh, response, things like wildfires, extreme heat. What about people who are really worried that all of this environmental issues, climate change, too much for, for kids to bear emotionally? That's a really good question. One, um, honestly, I think about um, as a both as an educator and as a parent, and I'm asked a lot about, um, and I think that's something that people are increasingly um, paying attention to. Um, there's a fair amount of research and just conversation around kind of climate anxiety and just sort of looking around the world and being like, what a mess, <laughs> like, how do we deal with this? Um, and I think some of the general rules of psychology apply, um, meaning that it's it does no good to ignore that, right? It is this is really really heavy stuff, right? This is heavy stuff to think about what we're going to be, what we're dealing with currently, um, that people are already suffering, and that suffering is probably going to continue. I mean, realistically, even if we do something really dramatic right now, we're going to see the climate um, continue to change a bit. Uh, so I think that that acknowledging that it's heavy is a smart move, especially when you're talking to children, right? Um, so there's no need to be flippant about it. <laughs> but I think that also I think we have to be honest with kids. Um, in in my opinion, um, I think it's 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 a responsibility we have to prepare student um, students or children um, because they're going to have to face these things, right? So it does no good to to ignore them. I think um, in general, my experience is that um, kids and young people are really eager to learn about climate change because they know it's a big deal. So I think um, being honest with children and letting them know sort of what's happening, I think is is a good thing, um, and sort of letting them feel those things that are like kind of helping them navigate those feelings of anxiety and fear and acknowledging them. Um, so, but on the other end of that, or maybe, and <laughs> in, in parallel to that, I think it's also important to understand that there are, there's hope, right? So um, the climate change communicators right now would say that there's five main messages that climate change is real. It's uh, happening. It's happening now. It's bad. It's pretty serious. Um, it's us. And, but then there's also hope, right? So I think that, that when, um, when we acknowledge that climate change is a really big deal, but there's things to do that can help people sort of cope with those, those issues of anxiety. And that includes children. Um, and really it's my sincere hope that some of our work showing that just simple conversations with people around dinner tables or classrooms or in communities tend to sort of change some hearts and minds. There's a lot of power in that. And my hope is that that also gives young people hope, right? Showing that they there's something they can do and it can be as easy as just talking with a neighbor or a parent. Yeah, yeah. I want to dig into that neighbor thing a little bit. So we, we know that kids might be able to have an impact on their parents' perspectives. What, what about other adults? That's a great question. And you should know about this because this is <laughs> this is some of what Lauren's um, uh, dissertation work is on too. So, so yes, so I kind of gave a long-winded response on to how I got interested in this sort of moving from kids think differently about climate change to they learn about climate change in ways that um, seem kind of kind of bring, uh, will stimulate collaboration rather than polarization. Um, and they tend to inspire adults to think that way too, at least their parents. Um, and then over the last couple of years, we've been sort of expanding out from adults to um, other people in the community. And we've done this with a couple of other environmental issues. So we, we think about climate change, but we also think about, um, we have a project on marine debris um, with little kids, with fourth and fifth graders. And we have a project that your project on water quality uh, with high school students. And what we're interested in there is uh, when kids uh, sort of engage communities in conversation, does that also move the needle? Is it is it there's something special about the parent relationship where they're especially influential or is it trickle out to other people in the community? And we're still digging into this. It takes a long time. <laughs> At least the, the stuff coming back is really encouraging. So for instance, in the Marine Debris Project, 
we the kids enrolled in our project held some community events uh, where they um, like had everything from public art shows to trash fashion shows to beach cleanups to um, some kids went to a um, did a presentation for some county commissioners and Pequoy of Marina. Um, and we at those events, we interviewed adults that were there. Also, kids um, from that project uh, developed some video public service announcements, which we direct emailed to local officials in their communities, and we surveyed officials. And what the data that came back from that showed the very similar things that we found in the climate change study, meaning after those presentations, people in general or more pretty like concerned about marine debris, but also when we looked across political affiliation, um, people came in polarized and then concern went up, but it was like it went like this. So people were not only more concerned, but more on the same page mm -hmm. it, it afterwards. So that would at least that would suggest that this sort of kid effect <laughs> to bring people together does seem to work outside of the family context, which I think is, is really, really exciting. Um, and we're, we're excited to learn more as we go. Great, great. So I want to keep an eye on time um, and make sure that students who want to are submitting questions. Uh, please submit your questions to us. We have a few up um, from folks who submitted them earlier. Um, Ryan was asking, how important are community-based projects for the environment and for kids? That's a great question. And I, um, my, my tidy response is very, right? <laughs> so, so I think that um, when we think about kid-based environmental kind of involvement, I think a lot of people think of like Greta Thunberg, right? Or um, activism. And I, I'm, I'm very inspired by that. I think it's incredible that kids are kind of taking to the streets and really raising awareness. And I, I do think it's, it's helping, right? Um, but I think what our what our our research focuses on more is more community based things. So there's a fair amount of research that would suggest, <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at kind of social movements or the spread of sort of complex ideas, um, often it is not so much activism that does it, but it's more about um, relying on social networks, meaning people that you care about and trust talking about issues. And then it sort of spreads slowly out from there, right? So it's not so much somebody on a podium saying, kind of raising awareness from climate change. I'm not knocking that. I think it's, again, I think it's really inspiring, but I think potentially even more powerful or community-based things. So it's talking to people you know and trust. So when we think about community-based um, kind of approaches to environmental challenges, I think it's it's really critical. So I think especially in a context where we as a country are so polarized ab about things, talking with people that you know and trust is really kind of the way to cut through that, right? So I think just being aware of these big problems, but really acting where you are, it sometimes can sound sort of Pollyanna-ish, <laughs> but I, I do think that it's, it's a really important method to, to try to bring people together and get engaged. Yeah, and, and kind of building off of that, do you have suggestions for kind of what all this re research that we've been talking about means for, for young people, for educators, um, for students? Yeah, great. Yeah, so so let's see, I'll, I'll start, I guess, with young people. Um, and so when you, I guess I will say when we say kids, generally that our research generally spans from about third grade to about 12th grade. After that, we kind of you're, you can vote. So we're not quite as interested from a research perspective, but in general, I'd say for young people, and I do think this includes college students too. Um, I really think you have power probably more than, you know, right. I think adults really do listen to, to young people, um, even if they may not admit it, even if they don't even acknowledge it to themselves. Right. And so I guess back to Greta, she frequently um, will express frustration that, you know, you, you, I'm glad that you like what I say, but like you're, you're doing nothing. Right. And, and that's, that's, I think activists in general want kind of big sweeping change, arguably like well-founded. Right. But, um, and that's not necessarily happening and the frustration is understandable and it's real, but I do think that um, people are maybe listening more than they would let on. Um, some of that is like our research would suggest that we're, we're starting to shift hearts and minds by simple conversations. And then um, sort of 
anecdotally, you hear stories of people sort of changing their minds and it, it just takes a little while for people to sort of process that. But I do think that in that process, kids are a really powerful lever to having those conversations. So one, kids have power. Also, it doesn't have, not everybody has to take to the streets, right? Just so just talking about things, I think is, is really, really useful and has a lot of power in it. Um, to, kid, to educators and parents, I think that the message to take away from this is that young people really want to learn about the environment and including things like climate change. And so giving them opportunity to do that is really important. And also giving them opportunity and encouragement to, to kind of use their voices, right? To use around dinner tables or in their communities and potentially even more important is to listen to them because they, they think about things um, and they're going to be living through these impacts. So it's important to, to consider what they want. Absolutely. Let's see, we have one more question um, coming in from Tanish. Uh, they say children have the right mindset to tackle climate change, but they don't exactly have the power at that age uh, to make big, broad decisions for their community. How can this kind of gap between decision makers and, and children be narrowed? That's, I mean, I think that's exactly what we're working on, right? So we are, um, we are really interested in sort of developing the best practices to do just that, right? So again, we are pretty interested in um, how ways in which um, child-led conversations or youth-led conversations make an impact, be that around a dinner table at home or um, out in communities or at town halls. And our, our data is suggesting it really does make a difference, right? And so we are, um, yes, children can't vote, um, but I do think that like nobody can hold you to account like a child. I will also say that as a parent. <laughs> but, and I, but I, th I think that's a really important role to have, right? And I think that, um, that kids, I think, I think we can hopefully communicate and support kids in understanding that they are part of the community, right? They may not be able to vote, but they're part of the community and they have a voice. Um, and so using that to, to affect change, I find a lot of hope in that. Um, and so I think that's something that hopefully we can, we can continue to support. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Um, and just as we're wrapping up, are there any other closing thoughts you want to share, ways for the students to get connected um, to our lab maybe? Yeah, great. So thank you for that. So, um, so a little um, pitch for those of you coming to NC State. Um, if this is something you're excited about um, when you get here. Um, so we, the, if you're interested in kind of engaging people in general about the environment, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved through, um, there's an environmental education minor here um, that is between our department, Parks and Rec, and the College of Education, particularly STEM Ed department. Um, and that's a great way to sort of put your toe in the water and see if you're excited about it. Um, it's also correlated with our state's environmental education certification program. So you can get certification out of that, which is great. And then um, find me, right? So I know our, my contact information is probably all over the website for this course. <laughs> and um, as Lauren knows, we are a fairly welcoming lab to undergraduate researchers and we, we'd love to have you. There's always tons to do. Um, so if you're interested in supporting kids, and having a say in the environment and in their community, come come find us when you get here. Awesome, awesome. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, join us next week with Dr. Karen Cooper, uh, who will be sharing a little bit about citizen science um, and how you can contribute to global solutions uh, through citizen science. Uh, be sure to check your mail for a citizen science activity. Um, and next week we'll be using that kit to assess the quality of your drinking water. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>